former heavyweight champion of Europe, Frank Bruno. Great to see you. Thank you very much. It's great to see you, sir. And I'm going to go in there and do my best like I tried my best tonight. And thank you, everybody, for watching me. Love you all. I know the story very well of when you went away from London to boarding school. Yeah. Or Borstal or whatever yeah. it was at the time. Can you tell us what happened and why, why you went there? My mum was a district nurse. My dad was a, a secret gambler. And it wouldn't make much sense being my dad because he was like me, he was dyslexic. So I had a sports teacher who didn't like me at all. I, anyone I asked for something as a sweet or whatever, I asked them in manners and do what, but the, this guy would have had it in for me, the um, PE teacher, and we went to Hyde Park. The lady had her camera. I asked if I could use her camera. And she, yes, you can. But he stuck in, his nose in, and then it got a bit messy. But not, I didn't touch him. All I'd done was hold him there, put him on the floor neatly and done a runner. Next day I was at my mother's shop. They called me to school and told me that I was, um, can't come in no more. And my mum went mad because she was a district nurse and she always was looking after me and whatever, especially when I was off school. And she was editing for me to send me to a ball stool when I cried for nearly a year. I think, why would she do that to me? But it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I was hanging around with the donk the wrong sort of like crowd and they were doing some shifty stuff. But I was always hooked to be with the sort of people, you know what I mean? And my mum said, don't keep on hanging around with them because they're naughty people. You were, you were a little kid when you were sent away, 11, 12 years old, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. And having said that, knowing your history, having spoken to the headmaster of the school at the time, it actually transformed your life going away, didn't it? It did. It. I didn't realise, you know what I mean? I'm away from certain different things. Some of the kids knew about everything, about everything. It was on the to sell this to nick that or whatever, but I thought I was hanging around with them and I don't, don't get too brave. And at the front, I'm always at the back in case the fleas come, I could do a runner. I used to have some nice shirts and nice shoes and some nice garments that you get out of there, you know what I mean? When you got a little bit older at the school, yeah. Uh, Mr. Lawrence said, right. you became a role model for all the other boys yeah. and all those great things that your parents had taught you. Yeah. You became a leader at the school. I was trying to because the boarding school, a ball school is not a nice place to do. All the bad, so-called bad boys would think they're tough. The guy in the blue van and the guy up to the ball school and you wouldn't want to see some of his fights, the, the testosterone around the, the, the coach. And when a lot of them go off the coach, they start fight, fighting each other. And I said, that ain't for me. They would, you know, do some crazy shit. They're all the bad people supposed to be in London, to, which switched away to a place in Sussex, Sussex Oakle Boarding School. It was tough, them teachers were messing around. And if the teachers were doing things today, they'd be locked up. But you have to, they have to go back to do, treating the kids like that because they're out of order. Mr. Lawrence told me that when you were like, well, by the time you'd been there two or three years, yeah. you got to 15, 16, you had encouraged all the boys to stop the bullying. You were one of the biggest, you were like the head boy there at the time, yeah. he said, that you were helping the old people in the almshouses, that you were starting to learn to play the piano. Yeah. Do you remember all of that? I remember very, very well, especially the piano teacher. The piano teacher was on the side of the, side of the fence, but he had the sweeties. And if he wanted any sweeties and to kill a little bit of time, I want to go learn how to play um, the piano. But it was, a, it was very feminine, sort of like, but it'd give you a sweet and try and taunt you into some dodgy stuff, man. But I said, I'm not into your dodgy stuff. But he's a good guy, he meant well. Did you learn to tickle the ivories? My, my fingers are too big. I could do ting, 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 and I'll get mixed up when you got to go back with this damn ting. <laughs> the piano's too big for me to play it. You looked after the old people there as well. They yeah, said you dug their gardens and stuff. Yeah, I worked for the old people. I went down and dug the gardens. The owner of the, um, the old people's homes, he had a, um, a Aston Martin gold what, green, and I used to look clean the chicken shit out. Clean this shit out the yard. They just clean out the dogs' things. I was a good, um, good cleaner. Worked hard for my, but I got well paid off Mr. Lawrence and whatever. So that's what kept me going. Do you think going there actually changed your life for the better in a lot it of ways? It did in a big, big, big way because um, when you've got about thirty to forty youngsters willing to go out in the town, go and rob somebody, 
and breaking someone's out, you know what I mean, house with that, no feelings at all, the wrong crew. What's your favourite fight when you look back? All of them, even the ones I lost. They're very interesting. Very dangerous place I've been sometimes, going into a ring with different opponents or whatever. But yeah, I've got I've, you know, in the ring. Frank, when you went into your professional career yeah. then, you win your first 21 fights by knockout. Oh, yeah. What do you recall about those early fights? Did you feel a million dollars? Did you realise you were going to I needed a little bit more sparring, a little bit more coaching, and a little bit more guidance where I needed to go. But I think t Jimmy Tibbs was having a war with um, t t Terry, Terry Lawless. And we all heard it, and it worked very nice. And it put to, went to a different camp. I stayed at Terry because, you know, I mean, I thought he was a good man. I still think he's a good man. God rest his soul. But when you get sort of like half trainers and half managers telling you what to do, you got to just move out of there because boxing's a tough enough sport in itself. Did you feel invincible in those early years? I never was program? invincible. You can't. If you feel invincible, you think you're superior to anybody's power or whatever. I just kept my feet in the ground, keep calm. And and in that early part of your career, did, were you focused on becoming a world champion? All through my career, I've been focused. Even when I lost, I was focused on what I needed to do. But sometimes I was a late developer. But as I got more older, I felt much stronger within myself, mentally and physically. As you became more well-known okay, with the British yeah, public, yeah. you became a, a household name even before you fought for a world title. How was that? It was nice, but I don't get um, carried away. I haven't got the sense to get carried away of this and that. Well. All I wanted to do what time I was fighting, I'm not going to be looked after or just checking the bounce. What were the things you learnt about yourself in that early part of your career? Looking after yourself, watch your back. And, you know what I mean, just watch your back and looking after yourself, which... Some of the kids didn't look after themselves, and some of them are dead now. Even Parker, one of my best friends, he, I went to his funeral. He wasn't nice, but you know, I mean, he died, and he wasn't even old enough to die. Very sad. Wild well, life. Mm. Were you a nervous character before fights? Um, sometimes I would be a little bit nervous because I don't want to go anywhere. I mug off myself. You know what I mean? That's why sometimes in the early days you used to knock him out. More better to knock him out if you can. Did you rather stay there being a nuisance? We didn't get paid for overtime, man. Well, you knocked out your first 21 opponents. Yeah. At that point, you then fight James Bonecrusher Smith in your 22nd fight. It's a very important fight for you. Yeah. What do you recall about the fight with Bonecrusher? Oh, God. I knew Bonecrusher was about two, three years before. We went to America and he was sussing out opponents. Um, Bonecrusher Smith was fighting in somewhere where I didn't even know. And Terry thought, he, look at him, look how slow he is. He couldn't punch his way out of paper bag. I said, Terry, are you trying to think that, convince me that that guy ain't got a punch? I know he could fight and I know the power. This guy's a dangerous guy, but I'm not going, I would fight fight him because that's what you want me to do. And I think you're fast tracking me too fast. You know what I mean? It's for me to learn the game. And Tim got him to the 11th round. I was on point, but at no point, saying that he was in front by 11 rounds. and 11 rounds, he, he stopped me. And come out the ring looking like he'd he gone around, puffed up eyes, puffed up cheeks, everything I just about could see. As you say, you were ahead in that fight on points on the cards. Yeah. But he caught you in the 10th or 11th round and you suffer your first loss. No problem with that. Life is lost like that sometimes. Were you fine about that? Or I how would you feel about it? Like I wasn't very happy about it, but sometimes you can't win without losing. You can't lose before you can win. So you've got to take it on board and whatever. And at the time, there was a lot of um, boxing coaches trying to tempt me to go and sign with them. They were offering me money, but Mickey Duff and Terry Lawless, they were a gang. So it's better to go into that crowd than going for uh, a crowd that is trying to do something similar to Terry Lawless and Mickey Duff. At this point, you're becoming not just a boxer, not just a sportsman, but a celebrity in Britain. Did you mind that? I it weren't really into that, you know what I mean, the celebrity business. Because once you go in there, you've got to buy the drinks for one. And then when all, if, if you go out, they're going to call you a sissy and all them different things. Because I'm not really a pub goer. I like to go out home and just chill out and just be by myself. But was there a time when you were at the height of your fame, if you like? We, we, we talk about you as being a national treasure. Oh, you're making me blush, man. But no. 
I'm never, but you were, you still are in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Very you funny. don't get many people coming up to you saying, oh, you're Frank Bruno, I don't like you. You're universally loved, you know that. Thank, thank you very much, you're making me blush, you know. I don't like watching myself, I don't like looking at pictures of myself, I don't like watching fights, I don't, I'm the biggest critic of myself, so I don't watch much. So if I got an opponent, I would watch the opponent rather than watch my fights. When you fought Lennox Lewis yeah. in 1993 in Cardiff, you know, right. massive fight. Yeah. Tell us about it. It was such a massive fight. He was upsetting me by saying some stupid things which he shouldn't have let him get to, to, to whatever I'm getting through. But I don't know how Two-Faced Rat could say something as like Uncle Tom when his mum comes from the same Jamaica as my mum. I would never call my mum that. I'd never call someone, but he hit that low. So I don't need to come out of my pedestal and grovel to him because he's, he's, he's nothing to me. But that was very, very nasty of a man to say anything like that. You may not understand it, but I understand it. I'm not making a big seed out of it. He can take that thank you stuff out where the sun don't shine. What do you recall from that fight with Lennox Lewis then? I recall quite a lot. I was just too anxious before I learned how to relax myself. But he won, so I haven't got nothing bad to say against him. But I haven't got nothing good to say against him as either. Because you were going well in that fight, Yeah, I know, I was there. The jab was working. I the... was there. <laughs> the cameraman's there. Yeah, he's there, but I was there at that women's fight. Should you have beaten him? I should have beaten him, and I hope I should have been, but nothing's before the time. I should have beaten him. I was out boxing him and different things like that. Mike Tyson and you. Yeah. It was great to see you two together recently for that I documentary. I felt privileged to see him, you know what I mean, without his entourage. Because I read something in his book when he slagged down every one of his entourage. They either take cars off him, do take money for this and take money for that. When he had a good woman around him, he would have not hard, he would have had a lot more money that he's got now. Was it enjoyable to sit down together in that house it on the sweet. sofa? It was sweet. I did at first. Sometimes you worry about certain things like that. But he was a sweet. He was a very, very good animal. But he was a good. He was in good form that day. But yeah, of course, he had everything. You know, what I mean, lions. He had a two pack, and the mob behind him or whatever. If you're that in the game, why would you let them men come around you when you got to cop the bill? And hang around with that sort of crowd, you know what I mean? The biggest Don Canyone or Crystal Champagne and all the things that they do. I wish I could get involved with all that, but I can't, I can't even get out the door, usually. So that first fight with Mike Tyson. Yeah. Tell us about that. It's, when it was out in Vegas, we tried to go to certain restaurants and whatever, but I think it, it, we had this fan soul food restaurant, which I went to every time I was there. But, Tyson's got this, the, the, the Vegas all sussed out, but he's, he knows all the, the tricks that they've got to play. Him and Don King at the time would play. You know what I mean? That's all I could say. They tried to get into your head, did they? The, the, the silly breed, what they've got in the, the lobby and saying stupid things, and then Don King's got about 200 Muslim guys up at the, the fight, and they're going to, you know what I mean, walk us into the fight. It's, very slippery, but you know what I mean? That's the way they played it. When there's so much money to be made around two men fighting, two gladiators, if you like, do you think boxers can be manipulated? Yeah, very easily, very easily. Don, Don King was a master at it, you know what I mean? He would do it. Frank Warren can manipulate, he's got certain classes on him. Say, if you win this far, I'll get your Porsche. Or if you win this far, I'll get your Bentley. But he's got the money from the, um, the fight to buy 10. <laughs> Ten um, Bentleys and that, but yeah, they use psycho psychology on you. Even Don King uses psychology. He went to prison, and what he learned about psychology and that got more slipperier than himself. But he done it the, the prison way. So even when you were at the height of your boxing career, did you feel at that point? Am I trapped here in this, or did you feel in control of it? I always felt in control. Of everything I've done. You know, I mean, sometimes some people say, I don't think he should be fighting this or that if it does what, they will go a different way. Mm. But everybody does it things in a different way. It was a great night when you beat Oliver McCall in the fight before that. Yeah. We were all, well, I think it was 19 million viewers or something. Yeah. And um, it was 
people were praying for you to stay up at the end of that fight because you were exhausted if you were... Oh, oh, God, yeah. The last couple of rounds. Yeah, yeah, very Take exhausted. us back through that fight. I was very stupid. The Atomic Bull, when someone's got a nickname and somebody comes to you, the Atomic Bull, there's nothing but when Oliver McCall came at me like a bull coming all the time and he was waiting to trap me and whatever, but I couldn't keep still because if I walked that way, I'd put him off his feet. If I moved that way, I got to do it in a different way. He was a horrible son, so because you hit him on his head and he still come forward. And, you know what I mean, if you hit him in the rib with the power going in there, he was at the strength of about 10 men. Can you remember the celebrations afterwards, what you did? I don't do celebrations as a wife and the kids have done more celebrations than me. I just wanted to go home and chill out. I've been away for four months, so I wanted to just chill out, hear the kids playing with their friends or playing with their, this, you know what I mean? Just come home and chill. A second Mike Tyson fight. Yeah. We're back in America. All right. It's your third attempt at the world title. Yeah. When you go over there this time, you've lost to him once. What do you feel the second time you're going in there with Tyson? So all I have to do is just try and go in there and wing it. When you've got a detached retina in your eye, which you're trying to bring, beat the subject, it weren't neat. So having something flicking in your eye all the time, that's where it was. I was supposed to stay in bed for six weeks. I didn't stay in bed for six weeks. No excuses. I was acting very stupidly. Did you, had you decided yourself that if you didn't retain your world title, that would be the career over? I went I had the career, they have to come very, it'd be very, very tough to come in my house and take the belt from me. Because, you know, I mean, that's the one that I won fair and square out of the ring. Had you decided before the second fight with yeah. Tyson that if you lost it, that would be the career over? I don't know, I think the career would have been over because if the doctors see, I think that's about three operations I had on the ice. I didn't have no choice what mm. to do to go and get the operation sorted mm. out as quick as possible. Was it hard? You're the rough, tough heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, Big guy, everybody sees you as a rough, tough guy. I'm not rough, I'm just a pudgy cap. When you're that position, though, and you're meant to be tough, is it hard to talk about what you have going on inside? No, no, hard to talk. I talk to anyone about what I've been through or whatever. Yeah, I'm open, because I know what some people suffer. I know there's a lot of men out there through the um, testosterone or whatever, they won't admit that they've got a, arm is hurting them, their toes hurting them, or they're not feeling too good in their brains. But they will get there one day and understand exactly what I mean. And if, if wicked, I wouldn't like them to go to the same route that I went to, where we're forced to take medication, forced to take an injection in your ass every month. It ain't a nice thing to do. It ain't a nice thing to go through. I was class as cuckoo, but I'm no more cuckoo than anybody else. Do you think <clears throat> that more men, because of what you've gone through and what Tyson Fury's talking about, mm. will learn from that and they'll be able to be more open. Men have got to learn to look after themselves, but sometimes the education what they give you, you don't go and see through them doors. And they would have never let me and you go through them doors to see what really happens. And you know what I mean? The way they're treating a lot of the patients out there, it's up down the road. The way they're treating the patients and whatever, is sad. It's very, very sad. And I think it's nice that we're talking about it as men to tell other men if he's not, he's not ashamed to cry, he's not you know, ashamed to you know, I mean, have a breakdown, but we don't need too many breakdowns. You've got different places you can go and get some help. I want to ask you about Tyson Fury coming to work with you with the foundation. Yeah. Tell us about the foundation. The foundation is a 12-week course. There's a lot of people around here or town scared to come in, but when they come in, their confidence is gone. So I'm just helping people, not teach them how to box, but do non-contact boxing to get some exercise. But sometimes you come in this room, there's about 20 odd people in there. Men, women, young kids in there, punching the bear, getting rid of their, their, their pressure. It's a nice vibe and I can't wait to, to open, to get it moving. Are you intent on transforming people's lives? I'm gonna try and give it a hat, I'm gonna try and give it a go. I've done a little bit of counselling course and bits and pieces, but I'm not going to say I've been to Harrods or Oxford Street to go and pick them. But yeah, I'm trying to help people. Is that a crime? I don't want nothing in, in return, but I'm just trying to help if I can. If I can't, I'd put them under somebody who might be able to help them. What's the other thing that boxing does for people who are not going to be a world champion or, or a professional? Just, just, just train. Some people like running, some people like swimming. Some people like the boxing exercises, what they can do here. And boxing is a very, very powerful game. Very, very powerful in itself. Encourage youngsters to get involved. 
And is it true that Tyson Fury might be coming along to help you with something? Tyson Fury has got his name down in the pictures, helping the Frank Bruno Foundation. So, you know, I mean, I think he's a good man. He's very kind of him. Frank, do you still watch all the big heavyweight oh, fights? Yeah, I do watch most of them. I was watching the fight last night, and I forgot which one it was because I fell asleep. But yeah, I do watch boxing. <laughs> what a lot. Yeah, seriously, I've got to work as much as you, you know? <laughs> and I get tired. So, huge fight now. And uh, Tyson Fury against Dillian White. What do you think of that? I think it's a good fight, to be honest. Dillian White is very powerful than what you give him credit for, but I think Tyson Fury is a dangerous and he can box. And what he's learned, you know what I mean? I don't think Dylan White would know he a freak. He's freak the sense I have him. He'd get there and he wouldn't know what's... If he hits Tyson Fury, he'd go on the floor and hopefully he'd get up. But he'd go into the ring and Tyson Fury's going to show him some movements and very, very upset him and get him wild because he's a guy that can adapt to any... If you're Southpaw, he can turn Southpaw. If you want to dig deep, he can dig deep. And he's a serious guy. Tyson Fury, if he had to fight one of the most dangerous men on this planet called Dante Wilder, and he couldn't take Dante Wilder and chuck the dummy out of the pram because he wouldn't shake his hand. But yeah, I wish Tyson the best. But he knows deep down in his heart, if he was around the days that I was younger and whatever, be eating for dinner and breakfast as well. You'd have beaten Fury, yeah? I'm not going to sit here and disrespect Tyson Fury, but we're talking about an error, what I'd have been through. I don't want to diss him or whatever, but he's living in a different cloud than to what cloud I was on. But Fury's the number one now in your Good view? Good luck to him, man. He's the number one. He deserves to be number one. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on him, try to get him to um, pack up and whatever, but I've got a lot of respect for him. What do you think about... Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua fighting. It'd be good for British boxing because both of them fancy one another. But sometimes when you've got so many promoters involved, they try and put a spanner in it and think that they could do it their way. So for Tyson Fury to uh, rent out Wembley, he's got to have six million, sixteen million pounds before the doors are open for that. You know what I mean? They don't know about. They think that they know about boxing and never knows what, but it's not cheap. What do you make of Anthony Joshua's career? Very lucky man, very better than a lot of people give him credit for. Can punch like a mule, but I don't know how Teletubby beat him. And when I see him, I've got to ask him, how did you let Teletubby beat you? Maybe you come back with something wrong or whatever, but I can't still get over it. What about the Usyk defeat? And it looked a little bit odd. Well, last minute or half a minute, he was playing around. And it, 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 it was going through a crazy time at the moment because you try and read people and you think that you can understand him a lot, but I can't, I don't. He goes on like he's a tough boy, he's a bad boy from Watford, but how he's, he's I'm not criticising him. You ask me a question, I'm trying to fulfil your question. It's scary to think what happened to him. If you'd been fighting Usyk, yeah. you're a big natural heavyweight, like you say, you might be 16 and a half, 17 yeah. stone on the night. What would you have done to Usyk? It's a difficult thing if George was around, he would say, put in a little bit of weight and weigh him down and punch him in to get him in the corner. He's very skillful. He knows how to duck and dive. He dances. His trainer even dances with him when he's punching the bag or sparring. So they've got an odd style. But break him up by back getting against the rope and try to soften him up because he's an athlete and he's a very good athlete at that. Yeah, Usyk is a very, very special guy. How would you like to be remembered uh, your time in the ring? Boy, you know I mean? There's a guy from South London that's done very, very well for himself reaches his heights that nobody could have dreamt of reaching his height. That's a guy from South London, man. Nothing special. Just a ducker and diver. Just like yourself and most of the people in this room, just ducking and diving, trying to earn a little crush so they can put in the, make their family eat for Christmas. Boss, you're getting tricky. I'd like... <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem, man. Thank no you. problem. You're welcome. It's, it's lovely no to see you. Cheers, boss. Thank you. You did brilliant. You know. Cheers, yeah, thank you, boss. It. Cheers, boss. Thank you. Me nagging you with my questions over and no, no. over.